but the studio didn't want him because his last few movies had bombed. Also, he is a very, he's a very difficult actor to work with. He didn't memorize his lines. He would have people, assistants on set, hold up cue cards for his lines because he felt that the first time you say the line in a scene, if you, the first time you read it, he felt that that was the most authentic performance he could give in that moment. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to the show. Anthony here. And James here. Today, we're finally, finally going to do The Godfather. This is probably the most requested episode we've ever had. We've been saving it. We wanted to wait like for a special occasion and also for you know the, the fan base to grow for the show so that'd be worthwhile doing it. And since we just saw it in AMC Dolby, it just got a re-release for the 50th year anniversary. We decided, let's just do it now. It's hot in the, it's hot in the streets. Everyone's so talking about right it. Now. So also, hot. the uh, the paramount show coming out about the making of the godfather which i think is coming out very soon yeah so i thought it was, we think it was a good time to finally cover it yeah and we we love the godfathers all of them and the first one it is so legendary and for good reason and we're going to discuss it in depth today but it's something that we have been holding off and it is so highly requested from so many of you um but i feel like we also we saved we didn't want to do it early in the podcast because we were still developing our podcast style exactly, yeah. and how we talked about movies and it could have been a waste if we did it in our first year or so because some of those episodes were yeah you know not very well done yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now that we have we've really honed in on how we approach each episode i think that we have something really cool for the godfather finally and also just being able to, we weren't really planning it for this episode but then we saw it in theaters uh, at Dolby Atmos in AMC in in Burbank, LA, California, United California, States, California, United States, <laughs> North America, Earth, Earth. Earth. <laughs> Milky Way Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> but seeing it in a theater, I had seen I've seen it in theaters, but it was a long time ago, and it was like a AMC like in Massachusetts. But I, I, seeing it on this very very crisp screen, um, it was redone for 4K. Um, so everything was color corrected. Everything was uh, the vibrancy contrast. Uh, it was retouched in every way possible. Every frame was meticulously uh, fixed and corrected from the film reels, uh, the original negatives. And it was made for a big screen. And the sound design was also improved for the Dolby Atmos experience. And I, I was just really stunned by seeing this on such a massive screen. I had not before on a screen this big. It looked beautiful. It felt like we were watching it 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and with a group of people who were very excited to see it. You could you could feel the giddiness of the room. Uh, people were clamoring for it to start, and also when it was over, everyone was everyone was applauding, and also everyone was laughing at all like the inside jokes about The Godfather. Like it's not like there are big comedic elements, but there are parts that have in time become funny and, and you laugh at and it's enjoyable. Like and, the cat. Yeah, exactly. Like the cat and like and things like that where everyone's cracking up where in theaters when it first came out, I'm sure people weren't really laughing at certain things, but now because it's so legendary and the scenes are so iconic, now it's things that the entire crowd and audience was laughing and I really enjoyed the experience. Now, I'm sure you've all seen The Godfather and this came out in 1972 directed by Francis Ford Coppola. He wrote the screenplay based on the book by Mario Puzzi, who also adapted the screenplay with Coppola, stars Marlon Brando, Al Pacino, James Caan. The aging patriarch of an organized crime dynasty in post-war New York City transfers control of his clandestine empire to his reluctant youngest son. Now, The Godfather is number two on IMDb's all-time greatest movie list. It is a 9.2 on that rating score. Rotten Tomatoes, it is 97% critic score. Metacritic, it is a perfect 100. What's number one? No Way Home? No, it's Shawsh <laughs> Shawshank Redemption. Uh, this film won three Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Actor, and Best Screenplay, and was nominated for just about everything else on a budget of $6 million. This pulled in $248 million at the global box office in adjusting for inflation and changes in foreign markets since that time. It's estimated that The Godfather made the equivalent of well over a billion dollars today, upwards of $2 billion, which is absurd. This movie saved Paramount Studios, who lost a ton of money in this time on some films. They took a bunch of swings and misses. And ironically enough, the heads of this studio almost ensured the failure of The Godfather with the constant control they were trying to take over the project yeah and you can um you can even say that the godfather could be 
um, one of the most successful movies of all time when you factor in merchandise sales, when you factor in DVD sales, Blu-ray sales, VHS sales, rentals. Posters. Um, posters and uh, TV syndication. Uh, you could say it's probably top 10, top five of most successful movies to ever be made. Um, and when you when you factor in all the ways a studio can profit off of a film, it's got to be up there. And the studio, ironically, like you said, the studio was uh, very difficult to work with for Cop for Coppola. And I think it's because they, you know, they're they were on their way out and they're they were risking a, a good amount of money back then for this project. That uh, at the time it wasn't a bestseller. So Paramount they bought this script when it was just a they bought they bought the book when it was just a manuscript. It was a ninety page or 60 page manuscript that Mario Puzzi hadn't finished yet, but it was hot. Um, people were talking about it in the lit agency world. And so that's what happens. Studios will often buy a book before it even gets published because it, agents and publishing houses will send it to studios as a way of them making extra money for their clients um, to try and get the, the book right sold um, to be adapted into a film. And so this is that case where they got it before it was a bestseller. While they were in production, that's when, the no that's when the novel really took off and became the bestseller of the year. One of the most successful published books at the time in history. It was on the bestseller list for many weeks, like many, many weeks. And it just, the sales were through the roof while it was in production. And that actually helped save the production at one point when the book took off. The studio was able to give Coppola more money because they felt more confident that people would want to see the movie. Because when they went into production, not it wasn't that widely known of a book at the time. And so luckily the success of the book fed into the production of the movie. Now, before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast, where you get awesome perks like our podcast schedules. You get to see first what we're shooting. You would have known that we were covering The Godfather today. Personalized videos, Patreon shows in the show, and a weekly bonus episode that every patron has access to in our Godfather tier patrons. They even get to pick an extra bonus episode that they choose themselves for only the Godfather tiers to see. We also launched our podcast masterclass online course last year. So for anyone who wants to start a podcast or improve their current podcast, our 22 chapter 46 video course will give you all the secrets behind the scenes of our show. The link is podcastmasterclass.teachable.com or go to our website, raidersofthelostpodcast.com. It's right there on the homepage. You can see all of our merch, custom movie posters, our sources of content. Follow, subscribe wherever you're listening. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hit the notification bells. And now back into the development of this project. If if Francis Ford Coppola had not been hired by the studio to make this movie, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. And uh, its effect on cinema would have never happened because if the studio got their way, it would have been a very different picture. They only wanted to spend $2 million on the film in total. And Coppola kept fighting for more money. Like I said earlier, because of the success of the novel, they were able to funnel more money into it. They also wanted him to shoot the entire film in Kansas City on a studio backlot, all sets and no actual exterior locations. And they also wanted to set it in the 70s, which is when it was made uh, in the early 1970s, 71. And that's where they wanted the 72. 72. No, production, though. Oh, okay. That's what I'm talking about. And so they wanted to change a lot about the, the novel. And the novel is a work of fiction, but it's heavily inspired by real things and real characters and real families and real dons. And it, it's it's supposed to take place in post-World War II New York City and Sicily. And Coppola understood the importance of that to the story, especially to the character of Michael, because he's a Marine. He had just gotten back from war. It also feeds into his character of being such, we'll get into later, such a brilliant strategist. And basically the way he his mind works is very much driven like an intelligent Marine as well. And so he fought with the studio neck and tooth to make sure that it was filmed in New York. And 90% uh, of the film was actually filmed on location in New York, which is very expensive. Uh, even movies to this day, they try to avoid New York City as best they can. And they'll build sets or shoot in like Atlanta or uh, like uh, Pittsburgh or things. Or there's sound stages in yeah, Los Angeles. Yeah, sound stages to, to avoid that, that cost. And also uh, he was adamant about shooting in Sicily, which also adds such another element in, in that chapter of the film that is so incredible. So... Uh, Francis Ford, Cop Ford Coppola sticking to his guns really made the movie what it was. It wouldn't have been the same without him. And he did a great GQ interview where he's talking about his battles at the studio. And he actually, he said he learned how to handle the studio when he was a drama student in college, uh, fighting with his professors who were trying to tell him how to direct plays. And he was trying to fight with them about how he wanted to direct plays. And so you could say it's because Francis Ford Coppola's disagreeable nature 
and also his tactics in terms of how how to like trick a studio into saying yes to something and making think, them think it's in their benefit as a way of getting what he wanted, which eventually, it, looking back in hindsight, the studio should have just given him, him everything he needed because The Godfather Part Two, they begged him to make that movie, which was ironic because they were controlling him the entire first film. And Sergio Leone was actually Paramount's first choice to direct The Godfather, but Leone turned it down uh, in order to work on his own gangster film, Once Upon a Time in America, which is also an excellent film. Coppola initially turned down the job of directing The Godfather because he found Puzo's novel sleazy and sensationalist, describing it as to quote Coppola, pretty cheap stuff. At the time, though, Coppola's studio, American Zeotrope, owed over $400,000 to Warner Brothers for budget overruns with George Lucas's film THX-1138. And when coupled with his poor financial standing, along with advice from his family and friends, Coppola reversed his initial decision and took the job to direct The Godfather. Coppola was officially announced as director of the film on September 28, 1970, and he agreed to receive $125,000 as well as 6% of the gross of the film, which when we talked about how much that was, it's a pretty damn penny for him. That's how, we, that's how we paid for Apocalypse Now. Yeah, and there was intense friction between Coppola and Paramount Pictures. Pictures, he almost lost his job a few times. They were very confrontational with him about who he wanted to cast in this film because he was adamant about casting Marlon Brando as the Don Vito Corleone. He was adamant about casting uh, Al-, Al Pacino as Michael Corleone. And Al Pacino at the time was pretty unknown. He was a stage actor who Coppola had gone to known through his theater work, but he was very unknown. You know, they wanted somebody like they wanted Burt Reynolds. They wanted a star like that to play the Redford. character. Robert Redford, yeah. too. But like Coppola was like adamant that Michael has to be an Italian American actor. James Cannes not Italian, so that's fine, but he was perfect for Sonny. The, and Paramount also wanted an Italian American director, which I give kudos to them. Because Paramount had done a couple of gangster movies and a big one uh, a couple years before starring Kirk Douglas. I can't remember what it's called, but it was a huge failure and it was not a very good movie. And Paramount recognized the movie didn't work because they didn't have any Italians in the movie. And it was about Italian mobsters. And like Kirk Douglas is like light brown hair. Spartacus. Yeah, Spartacus. <laughs> and, and as well as the rest of the cast, they were non-Italians. And they so then that's why they wanted to hire an Italian director. So they, they picked Coppola because Italian-American understood Italian culture, but also his last movie was a bomb. Coppola made a bunch of small films before The Godfather, really like ground his teeth and developed his and honed his craft as a filmmaker in these small budget, tiny movies. But his last one before this was a really big flop. And so they were like, we can get him for on the cheap, cheap, because they're always trying to save money. And so then they were like, okay, Coppola, you're our guy. We can get you for a small amount of money and you're Italian American because the Godfather, one of the greatest aspects to the film is its Italian American culture. How it brings things like, you know, the Italian wedding, how they're like chucking sandwiches across the air, the wedding and, you know, the the silk bag with the money and the music, the singing, it has so the the cooking. These aren't things that were in the novel, but that Coppola having grown up in Itali- in an Italian American home in New York understood like this is what it's like to be Italian in America. And those subtle hints, those little cultural flourishes, they really paint a beautiful portrait of what Italian Americans' lives were like post World War II. Again, th- this movie did have a problem of making it look like Italians were all criminals for many decades that they dealt with that. That, you know, that viewpoint of like, oh, Italians are all gangsters, that was a problem that came from this movie. But also, the rich culture shown in this film is such a, a strong part to it. Yeah, I mean, even Sopranos in the first or second season, I remember there's like a dinner scene with his therapist and her family. Um, where she, her, and her, her and her family are talking about The Godfather, how it still has given Italian-Americans a, a slur against their name and their culture and their how everyone thinks that they're all gangsters, all Italians are gangsters. So I like how they, that was like a meta example of bringing The Godfather up culturally in that TV show and how it's still talked about today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, there, we could get into that about why there's uh, a lot of criminal history in the past with Italian Americans when they came to America. You know, they didn't have any policing. They didn't have any anything really when they came to this country. So they had to police themselves. They were in the Italian neighborhoods. There's no police. There was no enforcing of law or anything. So it was kind of like the Wild West for Italians where they just had to kind of take care of themselves because they were getting no help from the government, no help from anybody. So that's how 
organized crime was for, was on the rise post World War One than post World War Two and organized crime. Well, even before World War Two, which is obviously in like the 1920s, organized crime families were becoming very popular and they controlled these Italian neighborhoods in the United States. Yeah, and also it was difficult for Italians to get hired for work just at normal jobs, and people refused to hire Italians or even speak to Italians. So it is there. It was a, it was like a necessary evil to get people to earn a living at to, at times. But you know, Scorsese does this. The, explains it really well in Goodfellas, I think. Where and also we we learn about in the opening scene of The Godfather, uh, with the man who the funeral parlor who owner who comes to speak to uh, Vito to uh, get uh, revenge for his daughter. You know, they're kind of like the police for the Italians. This is you can't go to the cops because the cops won't do anything. They won't help them, so they have to go to to their their dons, their mob bosses, and and it's it's a really interesting culture. But it was kind of a necessity for a lot of Italian Americans because they had no hope with police, with the government, and they had no help, so they needed people like this in their lives. Yeah, you know, they didn't explain it in that scene, but you could say Bonacera's daughter, the the uh, perpetrators got off be- is because she's Italian. Mm-hmm. You could say that's probably what happened in that courtroom. The judge probably dismissed the case because of her heritage. And like including the studio interference, not just with the production, but like you said, with the casting, uh, it was actually very difficult to cast this entire movie. And Coppola was doing screen tests with a bunch of well-known actors in Hollywood in New York. And what he would do is he would bring them all together on a set at a dinner table set and have them all improvise a, a dinner as their characters they're auditioning for. That's how we audition everyone, except for Al Pacino and Marlon Brando. So what happened with Marlon Brando and ironically, he won the Oscar. It's one of his most revered performances ever. But the studio didn't want him because his last few movies had bombed. Also, he is a very, he's a very difficult actor to work with. I think Coppola is the only person to really figure out how to work with him and not ruin the production. But productions with Brando were very tumultuous for a lot of filmmakers. He's a, he was a very aggressive, disagreeable guy, and he had a short temper. And also the way he acts is so non-traditional. He doesn't act. He doesn't memorize his line. He didn't memorize his lines. He would have people, assistants on set, hold up cue cards for his lines because he felt that the first time you say the line in a scene, if you, the first time you read it, he felt that that was the most authentic performance he could give in that moment without knowing the line, seeing it in front of him. And then he would just he would look at the line on the cue card and then say it in his scene. So that's how he acted, and oftentimes it was difficult for studios and pr- directors to direct him because, you know, you need to know your lines, Marlon. And also, he also wanted to do other things outside of the script, do his own thing, so it was difficult to work with. And so the studio only agreed to allow Brando to work on the film if he put up a bond of over a million dollars, which guaranteed that if he messed up the production, he would owe Paramount like $1.8 million. So he definitely didn't want to mess up the the production, putting that much money at stake. And then Al Pacino, you know, the studio did not want Al Pacino. They didn't even know who he was. They wanted, like we said, someone like Burt Reynolds, Robert Redford, Warren Betty, Ryan O'Neill. But Coppola wanted an unknown Italian-American actor. And like we said, he knew him from stage acting. And Coppola was quoted saying that he seemed intelligent, talented, and incredibly charismatic. And apparently the studio executives thought, Pacino was doing a poor job after they started seeing dailies and described his performance as anemic. And he added to, and Pacino responded by saying that like his performance is very nuanced. And he's trying to give Michael a very ambiguous nature for the first half of the film because it's not until later on when he gets fully corrupted by his by his family and by the Corleones and joins them and he's with them that it takes the entire film to get there. But remember the opening of the film, he's rejecting his family. He's rejecting being part of everything that they're involved in. You he can seems tell disgusted. that. Disgusted. Yeah. Yeah. There's you can tell there's a lot going on in his head. But also Coppola was worried as well because he didn't know that Pacino was doing that. And I saw this Al Pacino interview where he said um, Coppola took him aside one night and it was after, it was like two weeks into shooting and they had done a lot of the earlier scenes, like the stuff with Kay in New York. They had done all that stuff early in the production. Like the first thing they ever shot on The Godfather was her, him and Kay Christmas shopping. So those scenes and also uh, the wedding scene they shot early on. And the Salazzo scene yeah, at the end. Yeah, Salazzo scene. So... The in that in that performance of Michael, he's very soft spoken, very reserved. Seems to be angsty and holding a lot back. It it seems like he's not showing who he really is, which I think is a 
a brilliant part of the character development by Al Pacino. But the the studio in Coppola didn't know that's what he was doing. And so what Coppola did was the dinner scene where he's he, where he kills the captain and Salazzo. That was supposed to be later in the production, but Coppola moved it up ahead by over like a month, I believe, to get it early in the production as a way of of going to Pacino. He basically said, I'm going to give you the scene. You have to film it tomorrow and you have to show us what you can do. Otherwise, I can't promise you being on this movie anymore. And so it was really smart by Coppola to move that scene up early and they filmed that scene, sh did a quick cut of the daily, sent that to the studio. And then when they saw Pacino's performance in that iconic scene, they were like, okay, He's doing a great job. That's that really seals the deal for for the actor, and then they approved him being in the film from then on. Yeah, and that scene is one of the best performances in the entire film, and maybe in Pacino's entire career, which I can't wait to talk about later on because there's a lot of subtle things happening in that scene. And to keep going further on, Paramount was constantly before seeing this and accepting Pacino. We're trying to find reasons why he couldn't play Michael, like saying that he's too short to play Michael. He's it's, it's Hollywood. You can just put someone in, yeah, in, Tom Holland. in, in tilts, in stilts, or or in, in lifts, I mean. And Dustin Hoffman, Martin Sheen, James Cann also auditioned for Michael. Like we said, Burt Reynolds was off the roll, but Marlon Brando was threatening to quit if Burt Reynolds came on board. So <laughs> Burt Reynolds turned down the role. Can you imagine Burt Reynolds playing Michael Corleone? No way. Jack Nicholson was also offered the role of Michael, but turned it down because he felt an Itali Italian actor should play the role. I mean, I think Jack would have done great for sure, but... I, it's just when you watch this movie, it's so it defines Al Pacino, his career to this day. And he was really perfect as Michael, especially the, when you see the second half of this film and the entirety of Godfather Part Two. it seems like nobody could have done what he did. And the thing with The Godfather, because Marlon Brando's performance is so strong and I, it might be the most iconic film role in the history of cinema, the Godfather, up there, Don yeah. Vito Corleone, it might be the most legendary role ever. And, and Marlon Brando was perfect and, and destroyed and everyone, you know, <laughs> I'm sure every actor wished they got to play Vito Corleone in The Godfather. Yeah. And he's so much involved in the first act of the film. It's like his show. But really, Al Pacino as Michael Corleone might be the best performance in this movie. It's possible when you watch it because he just takes over the second half of the film. It's a very nuanced performance and the mo one of the most transformative characters you'll see in a movie because what Michael is at the beginning of the film compared to what he becomes in the final shot of the movie, completely different people. That's why I say that this is better than the second one. And so many people say the second one is better. And everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but... I think that people tend to get distracted by the extravagance of the second one. It had a lot more money. It's a, it's an unbelievable production. And then you have De Niro as Vito back in New York when he was younger. Vito Corleone. It's, Origins. Origins. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's a really wonderful movie. and it's a Top 10 all yeah. time. And he also won the Oscar as Vito as well. Um, but I think that the character transformation of Michael Corleone in The Godfather Part 1 is really what makes the movie work. And it's it, you could say it's one of the best character pieces of all time. Uh, the transformation from that wedding scene where we see our introduction to Michael, and like you said, to that final shot when Kay gets the door closed on her face and seeing Michael as the new Dawn, it's it's pro it's one of the greatest transformations for a character in film history. Yeah, Brando as Vito is essential getting that role right but michael but he's a flat character though he's the same from start to finish michael yeah. is the key in this film michael corleone al pacino is the key to what makes the godfather like transcend mob films besides everything else that Co coppola did with this movie and i think that pacino he he i'm sure he gets he gets a ton of credit for this role but i think obviously i think marlon brando's the godfather kind of shadows him in this movie because of the persona that he created yeah i think people look to al pacino in the second one as more of like he's the godfather yeah. for sure but i think that you know uh, like you said marlon brando being the legendary actor he already was definitely cast a large shadow and there's other really cool casting um facts about this movie like uh, talia shire um, she's actually Francis Ford Coppola's sister, and she he didn't want to cast her as Connie because he didn't want people to be like, oh, that's nepotism. But uh, Mario Puzo, the writer of the book, was adamant about having her in the role because he thought she was perfect, and she's great as Connie. She's a great actor. She proved herself for their career. And also Johnny Fontaine, who plays he's he's the singer in the movie played by Al Martino. He actually the real life Al Martino, he was up for the role, and then Coppola decided to go with someone else. Um, 
Vic Damone, who's another Italian singer. And then unknowingly, Al Martino, he was the godson of uh, Russell Buffalino, the New York gangster who's played by Joe Pesci in The Irishman, that Buffalino. And that Buffalino made a stink about it. And then the studio decided to hire Al Martino as Johnny Fontaine as a way to avoid any problems with the mob. So he actually has a similar storyline to his own character in the movie. Yeah, so according to Mario Puzzi, the character of Johnny Fontaine was not based on Frank Sinatra. However, it was widely assumed that it was, and Sinatra was furious when he found out and saw the movie. When he met Puzzo at a restaurant, he screened vulgar terms and threats that Puzzo Sinatra was also vehemently opposed to the film. Due to this backlash, Fontaine's role in the film was scaled down to just a couple of scenes. Also, Robert De Niro was cast in multiple roles in this film. He was cast as Polly Gatto, who was that driver who was sick when the Don gets shot in New York. Um, and then uh, Sonny has him killed. So he was he was actually going to play that role. Um, but then I think he left because it was such a small part. And then also he was cast as Sonny. He was going to play Santino, but then he left that role uh, to do a, another project, I think, where you would have had a leading role as an actor. So I think he chose the lead role over a supporting role. So it's actually him and Pacino switched parts in the movie. Uh -huh. So he was cast as Pauly, and then Al Pacino was also going to do The Gang That Couldn't Shoot Straight, which was like a comedy mob movie. Um, but then Pacino quit in favor of The Godfather, and then De Niro auditioned for the lead role in that film and got that, so he left The Godfather. And ironically, to do the former Al Pacino role, the gang that yeah. couldn't shoot straight. And ironically, it's a really, it's not a good movie. It's pretty bad. <laughs> well, it worked out for him, but it worked out for yeah. everyone because then De Niro got Vito in The Godfather Part Two, which is maybe my favorite performance De Niro's ever done. done. Um, and then Johnny Martino was given the role of Pauly Gatto in The Godfather Part One. Another great casting, I think, was James Can as Sonny Santino. Full name, obviously. It's so, a great name. Yeah. So, I think Santino, if I have a son, I might name him Santino. Sonny Corleone. It's a pretty cool name. Now, the thing with James Can is he's not Italian. So James Can's actually um, Jewish and German. And but because James Can is such a tremendous actor, he also has he's a very masculine, like powerful, aggressive character actor, very bold. So he was a perfect choice to play the hothead Sonny Corleone. Yeah, I I mean he has like this nature about him where you could tell Vito like he wouldn't want him to be in charge. Like he would make a bad dawn. He was making a bad dawn even, while while Vito was ill. And Vito even says that. Yeah, he like he would like he would start a war and and even like um Salazzo says don't lose that famous temper of yours. Not yet. Not yet. And then but uh James Can is terrific and he's perfectly cast De Niro. I think he would have done a good job as Sonny, but I feel like James Can is the perfect actor to to show that fiery nature that he has. And he obviously he has the curly hair and it's 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 a, a brownish color. It's definitely not. He doesn't look Sicilian, but you forget about that. And also he's got like the hairy arms. <laughs> that that adds in the favor yeah. of being Italian. Yeah. So but <laughs> and he doesn't look like he's a, a Sicilian, but with the tan. You yeah, know. It, I think they dressed him up a little bit and made him feel like he was he he was definitely part of the family for sure. Like. Yeah. And then Tom Hagen, played by Robert Duvall, was Coppola's first choice in that role, and he got what he wanted. Tom's a very great character. He's reserved, professional, very loyal. But Tom and also Robert Duvall, they're, he's not Italian, but Tom's character is an Italian. He's German, Irish, and he's basically was an orphan that Vito Corleone took in when he was young. And he became consigliere for consigliere for Vito. First non-Italian to that position, and he has this special practice where he handles one client. That's what he tells the Hollywood producer. Yeah, Duvall's great. We, we love him. He's an excellent actor. He's been in so many great roles, and his role in this film is great, as well as number two. It's an, another excellent role, but unfortunately, he was not in Godfather Part Three. I don't think he was asked to be in it. Um, for And I, I believe, from what I read, he was unhappy about not being asked to be in Godfather Part 3. Mm -hmm. I feel like he still could have been involved in Michael's story. For sure. But, I mean, maybe, you know, there are hints that, you know, Michael starts to come out of the family business by the end of the first film, so who knows if, you know, it was completely relevant to what their plans were for Part 3, and I haven't read the books, so I don't fully know what goes on after that. And then John Cazale, who... John Cazale... Cazale. Who, Cazale. Sorry, I always pronounce his name it's wrong. Sorry, right. it's hard to tell. Fredo doesn't have much to do in the first film. Obviously, we, we just get a little bit of a characterization in the, in the wedding scene. Then he goes to Vegas to work under Mo Green to learn the casino business. business. But then Fredo has a, a huge role to play. John Cazale, 
unfortunately passed away very young, gone too soon. And I believe Cancer. every movie he was in was nominated for Best Picture, too. Yeah, yeah. these two, uh, The Deer Hunter, uh, Dog Day Afternoon. So five movies that are not in Best Picture. There's one other one. I can't. I can't. I can't off the top of my head, I can't think of it. But I mean, he's such a tremendous actor, such a great side character actor, and just really adds so much. Even though he's not in the movie a lot, he adds so much to the family, the Italian culture, and the great characters of this film because that's one of the greatest strengths of the movie for sure is the characters. Yeah, and then Diane Keaton is really terrific as Kay Adams, Michael's girlfriend, and then his second wife. And she's, you know, she was a, a theater actress, um, very well known in the theater world in New York. That's how Coppola found her. And then after this film, she just exploded in the movie scene. She starred in uh, many of Woody Allen's films in the 70s and 80s. They even had uh, a marriage for a while. But uh, I think she was she's best known for Godfather and Woody Allen movies. For but sure. she's an amazing actor. Now, is The Godfather the best film ever made? objectively probably you know it's like saying the beatles are the greatest rock band of all time well, whether you true. like them or not it's a fact objectively it's true it's true. same with the godfather now why is the godfather one of the greatest if not the greatest film ever made i think the the first is the the strength to the intrigue and mystique of the italian mob in america but with a very romantic approach to the story and the lack of like mob crime in this movie is is shocking You're like there, there's assassination attempts that's about it that's all we see for crime we're not seeing the organized crime we're not seeing organized crime violence we're just seeing assassination attempts and you know this movie it's not trying to glorify mob violence mob violence is terrible it's you know these are not moral people most of them are either murderers or accessories to murder abusers thieves etc so we're not glorifying these characters but you know it's a very interesting and you know accurate story to real life events but i think just the intrigue of the italian mob was so fascinating to people and still is today and all in i mean there's so many reasons why i mean you, i would say if it's not the best film ever made it's the it could be the best american film ever made uh, um and it's mainly do i believe to francis ford coppola it's because of him like i said earlier pulling this off i don't know how he pulled it off honestly i was we watched this in theaters i was watching i'm like how did he friggin' do this it's insane um, whether it come down to the the legendary casting, uh, Nino, Put, um, Nino, what's his last name? The composer. What's uh, what's the composer's name? Nino, whatever his last name is. Nino score, the the iconic Godfather theme. Uh, Gordon Willis' cinematography. Gordon Willis, um, I think he he could be the greatest cinematographer of all time. He's up there, uh, even w when you talk about people like. Uh, you know, modern cinematographers like Lubezki and Deakins. But Gordon Willis, he shot some of the most famous movies of all time. Uh, these movies, All the President's Men, a bunch of Woody Allen's movies. Um, and he was actually called the Prince of Darkness because of how dark, he, darkly he lit uh, his movies. You know, people who don't like the Batman, those bad, those critics who were complaining about, complaining about how dark the Batman is, they wouldn't like these movies either, I guess. <laughs> um, but... You know, this movie was iconic in terms of how it changed cinematography because cinematography and lighting went through different stages in Hollywood. And the post-war, the pre-war cinematography and even the 50s, you have bright lights on actors. What they would do is they would build sets. Most most studios would build sets for any kind of movie. And then they have a ceiling full of heavy, strong, powerful lights to just beat down on the actors in different angles. So that's why... If you look at older movies, oftentimes, even in an interior scene, you'll see like multiple shadows for one person because there's these huge lights ab around them inside of the studio. Yeah, they didn't have fast lenses. They yeah, couldn't get as much exactly. light to the camera like you can today. Exactly. Well, they could. They just didn't. It wasn't really. Um, it wasn't. People didn't really spend time trying to develop that craft. And then Gordon Willis was a, an early purveyor of let's shoot it dark with minimal lighting with these lenses and. Um, it, even when the studio was getting the dailies of this film, they were complaining, saying it was way too dark and worried that audiences would be like, what's going on here? I, it's so dimly lit. But Gordon Willis ha was, was really honing in on something, and he didn't even get nominated for an Oscar for this. If, if This movie should have gotten nominated for anything. It's cinematography for sure. Uh, he did eventually for the second one. But I think that this movie in particular in America really changed the approach to cinematography with this dim lighting, these harsh shadows and contrasting looks 
that was so new for Hollywood, uh, people were not used to seeing this. One of the reasons why he did it was because Al Pacino's makeup, it didn't look, I mean, uh, Marlon Brando's makeup didn't look great with bright lights on it. And so he decided to shoot him with like overhead lights with very minimal lights. That's why Marlon Brando always has like this overhead light with deep shadows. So it showed off the makeup better. Made him look older. Made him look older and didn't reveal the, the slightly nuanced um, uh, imperfections of the makeup. Because Marlon Brando is 47 years old in this movie, but he looks like he's in his mid-70s for yeah. sure. And the lighting is... A, is he's a, barely he's, older than, like, Robert Duvall. Basically, yeah. yeah. He's, he's so... And he's Marlon Brando. He's a handsome guy, so how do you transform him into the Godfather? Yeah. And also, you know, he lit it so dark to as a metaphor to mirror, you know, the events and the characters of the film. And I think the opening sequence, the opening scenes are a great metaphor, and it, it show that because... We have this, it opens in this dark room, this dim room. It's very quiet, and it's where we're learning about Vito Corleone, the Don, the Godfather, and with Bronacera, and he's trying to get the request on the day of his daughter's wedding. You know, no Sicilian, no Sicilian can refuse a quest, request on the day of his daughter's wedding. In contrast, this dark room, you know, like I said, these are not moral people. Even though Vito seems like a hero to the audience, and we empathize and and we root for him, he's still a villain. He's a he's a he's a bad man. He gets he kills people. You know, he's a criminal, an organized mob boss. Although he'll kill people for just cause. Like he's not going to yeah. kill these guys. Yeah. I mean, he's going to mess them up. But we but... learn more about that in yeah. in the Godfather Part Two with his origin story. Origin house of Vito. Corleone. <laughs> Um, but, you know, we contrast this dark room, the secret world that he keeps hidden from his family that isn't part of the of the family business. We contrast that with very bright daylight exteriors of this beautiful wedding and ex extravagant Dancing, and bright and right, vibrant. Yeah. Everyone's having a great time. And, you know, that world is his Vito's world and his affairs. You know, Michael always keeps his affairs secret from his from everyone who's not part of the family business. Same thing with Vito. The affairs are just secluded and dark and just secretive and that's those two locations happening at the same time are a great metaphor for what's going on in the movie it's a great opening because you have the wedding which introduces all the characters immediately and this the scene is so well done in terms of the character work you see like little things little small behavioral things to show us everything we need to know about these characters whether it be um i have a list yeah so whether it be like sonny's wife um shows that he's uh He's he's unfaithful. He, un, unfaithful, and then she tries to make a joke with him across the the wedding, and he's gone to sleep with his mistress and things like that. Um, you show Fredo is drunk off his ass and can barely even like stand up when he goes to talk to to Michael and Kay. So great character behaviors. If you have your list, I would love to hear it. Yeah, so we have in the opening scenes, we learn so much about the family and the story. We learn of Vito being the Don, a very well-respected, feared, and powerful man. We learn the Corleones have deep Italian roots, political connections in America, and immense wealth. We learn Michael is special to Vito, but doesn't want to partake in the family business and is almost revolted by what his family does. And so we learn that he's special because Vito refuses to have the photo taken without Michael. He asks for Michael multiple times. Exactly. Thanks for adding more to why he's special. And also, Michael shows his resentment for his family by telling the Luca Brazza story to Kay with disgust. Yeah, and but when we see Vito looking out the window when Michael shows up, obviously he's been waiting for Michael to show up. That's like the most important part of the wedding. And also, Michael showing up late to this wedding, his sister's wedding, is another example of how um, much he doesn't want to be a part of the family. We learn, like Anthony said, of the infidelity of Sonny, the insecurities of Fredo and indulgences in alcohol, and the intense loyalty of Tom Hagen as well. And we learn that the federal government is investigating the family as they're writing down all the license plates and taking photos. And Sonny destroys one of those cameras. It's all done in 20 minutes. That's all, all of that's there. We know yeah. all of the characters. A lot of characters, too. It's we a learn big about cast. Johnny Fontaine. We learn about the, the extreme power that Vito has to not only... Send someone transcends transcend someone to superstardom, but the intense measures he takes to get those deals done. But also how casually he goes about his business, whether it be like so when he casually says tells Tom, I'm gonna send you to Hollywood and just take care of this Hollywood big shot. And it's like the biggest movie studio producer alive. And the way Vito deals with him is like he 
second like he doesn't even care he's make like, him an offer he can't refuse yeah it's like no big deal like this is nothing for like my day-to-day -day activities one of the other great strengths of this film is the absolute incredible screenplay and source material mario puzzo's book adapted into the godfather by him and coppola it's such well coppola did most of the adapting but he felt that because the screenplay that they came up with was so dependent on the source material he credit he got mario puzzo a credit as well and what i love about it is just like those details and the characters there are so many minute details and nuances in the script, whether it be in the dialogue or the actions happening. And it's also, it's not excessive in its Hollywood storytelling glitz and glamour. There are very few scenes that you would consider sensationalized or unrealistic. Really, the assassination the assassination of Sonny is a rare scene in this movie for being such a common scene in most other gangster movies, especially before this time. And, you know, that's those gangster movies focused on solely for entertainment. It's rare in this film. And, you know, this is a way that Coppola was highly innovative with this film because before The Godfather, gangster films were never taken seriously. And why should they have? They it were was at, a genre. You know, they yeah. were at times silly. The characters were cartoonish. They're just wearing fedoras, walking around with Tommy guns and shooting bullets everywhere. The Godfather transcended the gangster film genre, and it really just set the bar for cinema in general. It changed the the perception of you know what a gangster is, not this not just this person who's going to shoot up a a room of people or or a bank, and you know that was the genre for a very long time. And like like you said, at this point in the seventies, like gangster movies was like an old genre you know what i mean it's it's like even now to this day like if you're gonna make a, a if a gangster movie is gonna come out people like i don't feel, feel like they view it as seriously as they they might have used to especially after the godfather came out yeah because i think what puzo and coppola did with the film puzo with the book first is showing the relevant and fair comparison of organized crime to governments, to capitalists. You know, is there really much of a difference? There's that great scene where at the end of the, you know, in the third act of the film where Michael comes back from Italy and he wants Kay to come back into his life. And she's like, she's like, you're being naive, Michael. Presidents and senators don't have people killed after he compares his father to what he does as a senator or a president. And, she, and he says, now who's being naive, Kay? Because that does happen. I mean, we, we can say that. We can all admit that presidents, governments, senators, politicians this is something that they do and it's the same thing that ha happens with organized crime it's just like in the godfather when when uh he, henry's talking about paul he's like it's it's nothing it's no different than what goes on with the police or with governments you know they're there for the protection they're the enforcers they're just doing what everyone else does it's just that we have like this black flag planted on our home saying we're the bad guys exactly and I, there's some another great moment speaking of k in the wedding, which really informs her character and what happens with their, her relationship with Michael, especially in the second film, but uh, for sure towards the second half of this film is but when he he doesn't want to tell her the Luca Brazzi story uh, because he knows it will probably scare her um, and make it, make her look at her his family in a poor light, although he's clearly let on that his family's involved in the mafia in some capacities because she doesn't seem like too surprised. But... You can clearly see that Kay's number one thing is don't lie to me. Her number one thing is just tell me the truth. Uh, that's all I want is the truth from you, Michael. And ironically, that's what she never gets from Michael, even by the end of this film. And it's it's a tragic story for Kay because she loves this man, and all she wants is to him from him is to be open. And that's something that Michael can never be. And so that's a great introduction to her character. And you already know her motivation and her mindset being in the relationship with Michael, which ends up being ironically tragic. I also really adore the themes of this film, family, loyalty, power, loss of innocence, corruption, evil, capitalism. I also love the location jumps. We're in New York City. We're in Los Angeles, which is crazy to see the shots of the Chinese theater on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> it looks completely different. Um, Sicily, going to actually shoot in Sicily, spending a, a lot of time there, Las Vegas. These these elements make it feel huge in scope. They make this movie fe feel enormous. But also the feeling of watching The Godfather, as soon as it starts, you know, it's it, the ultimate escapism. You're in a world that you lose yourself into while watching, but also at the same time, you want to be a part of it. It's so it's so enticing and interesting and and tragic at the same time. It's a great Shakespearean tragedy in a lot of ways, too. Yeah, Nino Rota is the composer, Nino Rota, and he wrote the theme. And also Coppola's father, who was a 
uh, woodwind musician, um, like very proficient. He actually helped compose the theme in the second one and won an Oscar with Nino Rota for Godfather Part Two. But I think the musical theme, it's one of the most memorable in cinema history. Everyone, if, even if like you're a young person who hasn't seen The Godfather, if you hear that song, you probably know it is The Godfather. And uh, hearing that in the theater, it was just, it's uh, amazing. It, it adds so much to the film. This beautiful, beautiful theme. I think the Godfather Part Two has a much better score, um, but the Godfather Part Two, the introduction of the theme, is absolutely phenomenal. And this is during Coppola's insane streak of movies. So, within a few years, uh, several years, I think seven or eight years, maybe ten, Coppola made the Godfather, the Conversation, the Godfather Part Two, and Apocalypse Now. Uh, these are all some of the best movies ever made. Three of them are like in the top twenty of American cinema. And Apocalypse Now, is, you could say, is the best war film ever made. And then you have The Godfather and Godfather Part Two. It's it's unbelievable that he managed to make these four movies, not just in an expansive career, but just in a small amount of time. It's mind-blowing. What's absurd is 1972, The Godfather's released. Then in 1974, both The Conversation and Godfather Part Two are released. And the they're conver- competing for The Conversation the lost Best Picture to The Godfather Part Two. Absurd. Yeah. That might be the craziest three-year run, three-year run for a director ever. And Apocalypse Now only came out much later, I think, in '79. So like four years after Part Two, because he t- he spent so long editing it and shooting it. Yeah, but I mean, if we just go 1972 to 1974, that is absurd. Yeah, it's wild. It's uh, how do you do that? It's it's probably unprecedented that run of four movies in a row. I can't think of a li- of four movies in a row. Of a filmmaker that can top those four, and Guy Ritchie has a great little joke about that <laughs> in the Gentleman, where he's like, and then uh, he, he Coppola managed to release the the conversation between Godfather and Car- Godfather. Squeeze Part that two. one in between the Somehow Godfathers. That one. <laughs> it's great. Um, well, we're fifty minutes in ish, so how about oh, wow. we, we take our break at the intermission, and then we'll get back and actually start analyzing the plot of the film. We're not like, even on the plot yet. Yeah. Wow. How's that sound? Sounds great. All right. I knew this was going to be a big one. If you love the posters for The Godfather and The Godfather Part 2, there's no better place to get them for your place than at movieposters.com. Use our special promo code RAIDERS10 to get 10% off your order today. Movieposters.com has a gigantic selection of of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their arsenal. You can get anything from The Godfather to Spider-Man No Way Home to the new Batman posters to a Tarantino movie. Anything you want, they got you covered. As well as all sorts of sizes, framing, backlighting, any kind of poster needs, they got it covered. Again, head on over to movieposters.com and use our special promo code RAIDERS10 to get 10% off your order today. Heading into our (laughs) movie quote competition first. (laughs) Put up a note. Highly classified shit found. Signal intelligence shit. CIA shit. Hello, anybody lose their secret CIA shit? I don't think so. You think that's a Schwinn? He thinks that's a Schwinn. Osborne Cox. I am simply a A good good Samaritan. Samaritan. Burn after reading. Yes, sir. Chad. Great one. Brad Pitt. Okay. I have two, one for me and one from a fan. I'll read mine. So what are you saying? When you get divorced, you turn your library card? You get a new license? You stop being Jewish? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds really familiar. So what are you saying? When you get divorced, you turn in your library card? You get a new license? You stop being Jewish? I don't know. <laughs> like Lebowski and Walter. <laughs> <laughs> and Goddamn then, amateur. <laughs> fucking amateurs. <laughs> and then uh, uh, we have a quote from... Mac Wells, really? I live in Queens. Did you put that together yourself, Einstein? Hmm. Really? I don't know. The Usual Suspects. Ah, oh, man. It's a tough one. That is a good one. I haven't seen that movie in a while. Thanks, Mac. All right, let's guess this movie release here now. Almost Famous. I did Almost Famous. No, yeah, way. Yeah, 2000. What? Yeah. That's wow. so weird. That's crazy. Wow. All right. Wow. Well, wow. How to tell your twins. <laughs> wow. All What's right. your quiz? Movie pop quiz time. Name five actors who have portrayed the Joker in film. Joaquin. One. Heath. Two. Jack. Two. Three. <laughs> Jared Leto. Four. In film. 
I don't know that guy's name from the old one. I don't know. Well, there's Cesar Romano. Yeah. That's, and then there's another one that... Well, let me think. Very, very popular and famous guy. Um, Very famous guy. Very famous. Like, wicked famous. Like, played one of the most iconic characters in film history. <laughs> famous. Shit. Um, try and think of Jokers. I don't know. Mark Hamill. Oh, because Phantasm is movie. It's a movie. Yes, Mask sir. of the Phantasm. Yeah, he's he's done ten voicings of the Joker actually. Yeah, and that's the that's the film release though. The big one, the big movie one. Yeah, yeah, the uh, the animated series, but also yeah, Justice League. No, but the Batman yeah, yeah. Mask of the Phantasm. Yeah, Return of the Joker is another one. Mask of the Phantasm. That's the yeah, theatrical that's the release. Yeah, the animated, nineteen ninety two, I believe. Something like that. Um, I was just thinking live action. Yeah, I knew that's why I was kind of a joking. trick question. Yeah, you're a fucking asshole. Hey, watch with the f bombs. You're Sorry. like dropping them like crazy. Sorry, I just love. I gotta edit these it. out. <laughs> I'm making your job hard. Just Jeez. know they're all in the intermission. <laughs> just all you need to know. Okay, here's my quiz question. What is the name of Philip Seymour Hoffman's character in The Master? Oh, um. Give me a sec. Oh, man. God damn. <laughs> I've seen this movie like eight times. Then it should be easy for you. I know. <laughs> oh, man. I'm really disappointed in myself right now that it's not coming to me. Last name Dodd. Last name Dodd. Um, first name... Last name ever. First name greatest. <laughs> <laughs> Last name Dodd. First name Ah D Dodd. <laughs> Todd Dodd. <laughs> I forget. Rod the, Dodd. What's the, Lancaster. Lancaster. Oh, I got the last name, so I'm not completely disappointed in You're myself. You're not completely wrong. Yeah. You get a half credit. Yeah. It's a great name, though. Yeah. Lancaster. That's a good name. It's a city, <laughs> city in California. <laughs> Todd Dodd. <laughs> Todd Dodd. <laughs> All right. Um, who we got for haters? We got some unsubscribes. Oh, we got some unsubscribes. This is a good, good batch of unsubscribes. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, you made a video talking about the uh, ridiculous negative reviews of the Batman because he doesn't smile in the movie. And then uh, AJ Capes 11 wrote, Batman not happy enough, unsubscribed. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> and then uh, you commented on, remember that guy made that Batman goatee cowl video? Yeah, yeah. And Justin. Then, and then uh, you commented, this is amazing. And then Vince, Vincent Hamp 86 wrote, hey, stay on your own TikTok page or I will unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Andre uh, Marachi uh, about our... Um, one of our Patreon episodes. No mention of the prologue for Hook. Unsubscribe. <laughs> no, but good choices though. <laughs> 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 and then uh, Mr. Man, nineteen ninety five, in our cameo episode, said that we didn't mention the show Entourage, even though it's just one big cameo. Unsubscribe. <laughs> he's right. He's right. That is that. Yeah, everyone's in that show. And then City of Books. We couldn't think of uh, the, the actor's name in Mallrats. And then City of Books wrote, "How do you know? How do you not know that's Jason Lee?" And Mallrats, unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> the legendary actor. <laughs> and then uh, Preston Greer wrote, uh, the villain of the Karate Kid is the teacher. We couldn't think of his name, so we just called him the teacher. <laughs> it's U.S. Army Captain and Sensei, John Kreese, <laughs> unsubscribed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And our Godfather Patreon shout-out for today is our great friend, Brooke Shanks. We love you, Brooke. You're a big fan of the show. We love interacting with you. Uh, you're a friend of ours now. We have we just love chatting movies with you, and we are so grateful that you have joined our Godfather tier. On the day of the Godfather episode, we you become... Joined off we could, we you became, yeah, we were going to either murder you or you become a Godfather veteran. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. And she actually chose a really cool episode for her special Patreon Godfather episode, which we're going to film in the next week or two. It's going to be a good one. What she choose? I can't tell. They're not patrons. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's a secret. Well, you can tell me off camera later. Yeah, I'll tell you off camera. Uh, we have a, a great review from Podcaster M. I just started listening to this podcast and already love it. These guys are funny, interesting, and very knowledgeable. It's also pretty clean compared to a lot of podcasts out there, except for when Anthony drops his F-bombs. <laughs> I will definitely keep listening to this podcast, and don't worry. I'm going to edit his F-bombs out. And uh, let's move is on. that in the review, or are you just saying No, that? I added okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Podcaster M does not edit the show, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know that he edited our show or she. That's so great. <laughs> Thanks, Podcaster M. Uh, on this day in film history, today is Monday, March 7th. In 1986, Highlander was released. Highlander. According to Ricky Bobby, the greatest film ever made. Uh, in 2010, the 82nd Academy Awards happened, and The Hurt Locker won Best Picture. Jeff Bridges and Sandra Bullock also won, and also, also Catherine Bigelow won Best Director that year. 2014, release of 300, Rise of an Empire. And happy birthday to Brian Cranston, Rachel Weiss, Jenna Fisher, Wanda Sykes, and Matthew Vaughn. What do you got for a streaming recommendation? Little Miss Sunshine on Amazon Prime. It's a great little comedy I forgot to do my streaming rec, so I'm going to double that. I did too, but I just quickly looked at Amazon. What's your second? Oh, so you you, you also forgot to do it too. Well, I, did I just say it my, or not? My streaming recommendation <laughs> is to go to the cinema and see the Batman. That's not streaming. Well, it's, it's streaming because I say it is. <laughs> it's streaming from the projector onto the screen. <laughs> That's. I mean, you're technically right. <laughs> That's correct. There's a stream of light or a beam of light it's streaming it's all right streaming let's let's move on and get back into the godfather kid godfather now we kind of talked about the characters but let's let's just focus on them for a little bit i guess yeah and we only just talked about the casting i say let's start with with uh Vito. Vito corleone played by marlon brando again he's 47 years old in this movie uh we did we posed questions on instagram for for everyone to ask us about their question about the godfather someone asked does was marlon brando's voice really like that or was it just for the character this is just marlon acting and you know it's one of the most incredible and embodied performances in film history. And Marlon Brando, you know, he helped change the game of acting and pioneer actors. And uh, he, cre- he basically, in almost, he, you can say he invented method acting, basically in a way. Yeah. And, you know, he he improvised a screen test with Coppola to, in order to get the film because, like we said, Paramount didn't want Marlon Brando in this role. And even the pr- the president of Paramount Pictures was quoted by. Uh, Coppola, by me, by Coppola saying Marlon Brando will never be in this motion picture unless he does all those things that Anthony said the stipulation. Um, and t- for the screen test, he put a bunch of Kleenex in his mouth, shoe polish in his hair. He wanted to create that bulldog look that he wanted to for Vito. But for the actual filming, they had an actual prosthetic jaw made that was in he would put inside of his mouth made by a dentist to give him that bulldog look inside of his cheeks. Yeah, and also he wanted like that one lip on the side is raised a bit, like Joaquin does it. In um the in the master like the like this one lip raised and it makes him look like he's just scary to look at mm-hmm. and very intimidating. And Dick Smith did the makeup. He's an Oscar winning makeup artist. He's done so many great movies, but this is one of his most memorable transformations and probably most famous transformation he's done for an actor in a film. Yeah, and in Marlon, like I said, in terms of method acting, he also uh, pioneered improvisational acting. And one of his things as an actor, and it makes it's so genius. Um, is he always says you can tell when the he can tell a bad actor when you watch their hands in a scene because you, you, an inexperienced actor like they'll be performing a scene but then their hands will just be hanging at their side the whole time and it's that's not how people stand people often in terms of natural behavior we do things with our hands like you're pushing yourself up I'm moving my hands like this you put your hands in your pocket you pick something up James is doing a thumbs up and so no matter what situation you're in it's very rare to just have your hands just like hanging flat down on your side. And ever since reading this interview with him, whenever I see that on a movie, I'm like, that actor is just like, it, they they look like they're stiff and frozen. And he's all about creating natural behavior. That's what he pioneered in terms of method acting and improvisation. And so no take is the same. He's always trying to use his environment, uh, whether it be like the orange scene, like cutting the orange, that was his idea to act like a monster for the kid. Coppola just like runs the camera with Brando and lets Brando do his thing. With another one great... Um, the cat is great improvisation. The cat liked him so much. Brando's like, let me just pet this cat the whole time. Um, and he's so, like I said, he doesn't do that many takes because he doesn't even know the dialogue. So he only needs to do one or two takes, probably tops. Um, and a, a great, a, another great thing of improvisation that I saw uh, is when he's having that meeting with Slot. So oh, I was gonna say this, <laughs> and then he goes to sit next to Slot. So what he does is he like brushes a little dust off his leg and. That's something that no actor would do except for Brando. Uh, I think that for him, he always was able to just completely transform his reality into the scene. And it's like he's not being watched by a camera anymore. He's just a person interacting with another person or a room full of people. And he's interacting with a room. I think that uh, you could say no other actor has been able to make the camera disappear 
from their reality like Marlon Brando. And Vito Corleone is a very much respected man in organized crime. You know, these five families, Vito is one of the heads of houses. And he's grown this empire, you know, from Started nothing. with olive oil. Started with olive oil yeah. and gets into casinos and gambling and even says woman as well. Uh, but Vito, in one of the main conflicts of the film, doesn't want to move on into drugs, which is what the Tatalias want to do because they're also secretly backed by Barzini. Barzini wants to get into drugs. And also Salazzo, Virgil Salazzo, who's basically like a drug kingpin working with the Tatalias and also being backed by Barzini secretly. He's the producer of, yeah. They want to get into drugs and they want Vito's investment of a million dollars. They want, this is what Salazzo proposed at the meeting, a million dollar investment. And also to Vito to offer his political and judicial uh, allies for protection and for movement of product and everything like that. So they want to make a deal with Vito, which leads to Vito respectfully turning it down. You know, Vito's a very respectful person, and especially when it comes to the other families, he doesn't want a war. Uh, but because he turns them down, that's what starts the war. Because Barzini, you know, they know, they all seem to know that the Godfather, he's sort of on his way out, he's getting old, but also his way of thinking is old it's it's as Salazzo calls it at the end of the film with I mean towards the end of the film with his final scene with Michael he says it's like outdated he's basically like an antique when it comes to the the world going forward which you know you understand that perspective it makes sense you know he's old time thinking he's not a modern thinker like like he knows that Sonny was hot for his deal and Tom Hagen knew it was right the right deal whether Michael or Michael agreed with the deal or not uh we, we don't really find out in this film so even though he's a very well-respected and, and grew this empire from nothing, which I love finding out how he grew the empire in Godfather Part Two. Origins. It's it's a dangerous business for everybody. And even the Vito, even the Don, even the Godfather, his, his job and his life has an expiration date sooner than the average person because of the business he's in. And it's just business. It's not personal, which is a common phrase in the film. And you can also tell that the, the other families have been holding a lot of resentment towards Vito because he has a unique situation of having terrific, strong relationships with politicians and judges, which the other families don't have. In New York, In New York. And so they're desperate for that. And that's I think that's the main reason why they retaliate, not just because he rejected them, but because his rejection means that because he's just saying no, not just to the deal, but also no to using my um, political friends and judges to keep your men from being arrested and uh, face criminal action. And so the retaliation was a combination of that plus rejecting the deal. Plus, it's think of it sort of like a monarchy in a lot of ways. It's a you great know. plan by them, too, to, oh, yeah. to take them out. It is a great plan. It's, you know, it's, it's It would be smart to do what they're doing. You know, They're trying to now take over because the, the Corleones are probably the most powerful when Vito was in his prime. Because even Salazzo, he's like, if you think... One million dollars is just chump change, then salute to you. Yeah, so Vito, I'm sure in the prime of the Corleone house, the Corleones were the most feared and powerful in the entire country. But now that Vito is on his way out and his his heirs to the to the family, it's going to be Sonny next in line. And everybody knows Sonny is a hothead and knows that Sonny will probably run the family into the ground. And it can't be Tom because Tom's not Italian. He's not part of the family officially, even though he's acting Corleone. He's, he's acting um, Consigliere. Consigliere and then becomes acting Don at specific points of the fa of the franchise of The Godfather for temporary reasons. But, you know, it can't really be Tom. And then there's Michael, who is a civilian, who they call him. They all know Fredo isn't going to be the head of the house at any point. So it's really going to be Sonny. And now that Vito is slipping, his, and, you know, Sonny and Tom warn him that we have to get into this. Tom specifically he says because in 10 years we will be the weakest of all the families and they'll just take us over. And also you can see that Vito is very hard on Sonny like when he uh, basically chews him out for speaking out in that meeting just for having an opinion in the meeting. You know, he, he kind of embarrasses Sonny in front of everyone. He's like, I have a soft spot for my children. Yeah, I spoiled them. And and also, even after the meeting is over, then he has another word with Sonny. And he's he, he's very hard on Sonny, I think, because he knows, like, he's next in line to succeed the throne as the Don. So I think he's trying to prepare him, trying to be hard on him. Fredo, he doesn't have to worry about because Fredo, he's never 
in, in his entire life has never shown any kind of leadership qualities, any kind of backbone. Um, he's not a leader. He's a follower. Um, he's He's been a wayward kid. And so there's even though they've never even had the conversation about Fredo not being the Don, but there's no need to. It's like that. It's just like over time, I'm sure it was like Fredo's Fredo. You know, he's not going to be the Don. Like we don't even need to discuss it because Fredo, he's just he's a very weak willed person. He wouldn't even want to pursue being the Don. But then he's he holds back so much anger and resentment towards Michael and Godfather Part Two for being like, I'm the older, I'm your older brother. You're gonna take care of me. And so it's like he. It's not until after these years of this passivity of living this life of being walked over, then he finally lashes out and tries to take Michael out in Godfather Part Two. But he seems to be um, reluctantly comfortable where he is as just being, you know, the eldest son who's kind of just sitting there in the corner, nothing important to say. Um, his he loves his dad. He and he, he'll even he'll even drive he, drive his dad as his driver. He's like when Paulie's sick, he's like I'm happy to get the car pop. It's like he's he's like willing to be a driver. Whereas you know a great example of 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 Fredo showing those qualities is you mean Michael. And we, and we, I mean no Fredo. Oh, and we okay. get and yeah let me continue Sorry. let me continue guy and a little Sorry. um you know a little foreshadow of Godfather Part Two is when you know the second half of the film when Michael's in charge of the family and then they go to Vegas and Fredo's been there learning the casino business under Mo Green who took him in under under part of the deal because Vito and the Corleones bankrolled him but when he started his casino out in Vegas so he took Fredo under his wing during the war and it was uh, a sort of protection in a way for him as well and Fredo after Michael comes and embarrasses Mo Green embarrasses Fredo Fredo takes Mo Green's side and you can tell that you know Fredo probably enjoyed the life he was living in Vegas and he probably seemed like a hot shot until Michael came in and messed everything up for him and and made deals that he didn't agree with that's when he starts to build the animosity for Michael that just brews deep down until he eventually I'm sure we've all seen the Godfather part 2 we're about to spoil it for a second where he <laughs> eventually betrays Michael in part 2 that's an excellent point because it seems as though Fredo I, I'm sure his relationship with Mo Green was way better than any relationship with his family members and his father. Like, it was the brother he always wanted. You know, someone who actually, like, let him do things and spoke to him in probably a more loving way and actually gave him real responsibilities. And then what's Michael do? He takes him out yeah. and takes his casino from him. I mean, I'm sure from Fredo's point of view, he's like, what the hell are you doing, Michael? Like, what what, what are we supposed to do? You didn't even tell me you were going to do any of this. You just do this without informing me. But I think that's actually an indication that Michael would have sided with his father on the drug deal because he, probably. Does, because he goes to the casino business as, with his father's advice as opposed to getting into drugs. And then he tells Kay at the end of the, when he goes to get her back, that the Corleone family will be completely legit, legitimate very soon. He keeps telling her that over and over again. Now, Michael, he seems to be uh, Vito's, maybe not his favorite son, maybe if you don't want to say he has favorites. I'd say his favorite. But he's his most, you know, he has the highest hopes for Michael for sure. And Michael's a decorated Marine, a war hero, but we never learn of his exploits from the war. He arrives late with Kate to the wedding. We've already discussed how he despises the things that his family does, the crimes his father and family commit. And it's not until the assassination attempt on his father and then saving his father's life in the hospital that he decides that he's going to be all in with his family. He's with his father. And then he kills Salazzo to get revenge. And he's completely corrupted by his family at this point. So, But what makes Michael so special to Vito is I think that Vito, especially after you watch The Godfather Part Two, you see so much. He probably sees so much of himself in Michael. He sees the brains. He sees the incredible leadership qualities, the bravery, the loyalty, the structure. He probably sees so much of himself in there. The reserved nature with tremendous leadership, and he eventually wanted Michael to be the one pulling the strings of everything. You know, even though Vito has immense power, wealth, and connections, he's still like the great graphic of the poster, not pulling the strings of the world. That's what he wanted Michael to be—a senator. Corleone or Governor Corleone. We'll get there, Pop. We'll Even get there. President. Maybe one day. And also, I think that we see throughout this film, Michael is a brilliant strategist. He's the smartest of the kids by far. Uh, but like you, I'm not sure the loyalty is a word you can use to describe someone who um, kills his brother-in-law and also kills his own brother. So loyalty, I think that Vito saw... 
a lot of his own qualities in Michael, but I don't think he saw the the really dark, cruel side of Michael ever. I that's think that's a good point. I think that's something that Michael always hid from everyone, because Mike, because Vito, you don't look at Vito like he's a villain. You know, he's 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 very he loves his family very much. I don't think he would do anything to ever harm his family in any for any reason. But Michael, on the other hand, by the end of this film, and especially by the end of the second film, you look at him like he's a villain, like he's a true anti-hero. And that's the difference between Michael and Vito. Michael has a lot of Vito's qualities, but he also has an extremely dark nature to him. This cruel, um, ruthless quality where he will he won't forgive anyone for anything. Um, and I think one of the one of the best depictions of this is um, when Kay's asking about um, Connie's husband. What's his name? Uh, him getting killed. Uh, uh, Carlo. Carlo. About Carlo's death, saying that she thinks that he killed Carlo. And then um, just Kay asking him this crazy question, like this can't be true. But her him her asking him this question, he freaks out on her. He's like, he's like, only once. I'll let you ask me about my business just once. And then you see, like, because he seemed to be so sweet to her in the opening of the film and seemed to be very warm and even kind. But now, I think this is his true self. I think he was guarded and trying to be that. He was trying to be a, a husband, trying to be a good boyfriend, trying not to be himself, not a Corleone, not a criminal. And then by the end of this film, I think that's his true self. It's not... It's not. You could say it's not so much that he's going through transformation, but he's finally unraveling the true Michael Corleone inside of himself. And then this is Kay witnessing it for the first time. Only you can ask him one thing about his business, and that's it for the rest of your life. It's such a crazy thing. Well, to counter that, what periods of time do we see of Vito in Part One and Part Two? We see Part Two. We see his origin story coming to America, getting vengeance on. The man who killed his mother getting vengeance on the neighborhood, everything, the, the man who's running the neighborhood. Yeah, the neighborhood gangster, We yeah. see young versions of Vito, and then Godfather Part 1, we see a very old version of Vito. But we don't see Vito in his prime. We don't see the things that he... Maybe he did the same similar things that, that Michael did. Maybe he did horrible things to anyone who betrayed him, just one thing. Maybe he, ha he has killed family members. I mean, how else do you build that much respect and power and people fear you? So I think we can't assume that we don't know what Vito's done throughout his career as the mob boss, as the head of the Corleone family. Because when you go and watch Godfather Part 3, Michael seems to be more like Vito than he is in the second one. He seems to be like more important. He's more focused on his family. He loves his daughters very much. So I think I think it's a transition for both of them. I think that we I can assume I assume that Vito did similar things to Michael. I would Michael counter did. that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Triple counter. So so first of all, you're right about Godfather Part Three. It's because and but that he's trying to atone for his sins. Yeah, maybe his Vito's father, already done that. Well, Vito never did that because because he never like became like a huge philanthropist and charitable donator, which Michael does in Part Three to try and offset all the sins he acted out also Vito came to America by himself with nothing on his back no family so he didn't have brothers or sisters that he could have betrayed okay, and true. killed but, but he could have very loyal I'm friends sure he he, I'm sure that's possible but I, there's a difference between having a friend or someone who works with you as opposed to a family member that you murder that's a great point. That's I'll a, counter you again. <laughs> with, no, I, I got nothing. <laughs> so it's, you're making you. I understand what you're saying, but Vito. I think that Vito is not the same as Michael. I think Michael is a much darker character, and I think that's what makes the movie so great. He is, in a way, the ultimate antihero. He's the villain of the story. He's also the protagonist of the story for both Godfathers. But he is so much like Vito, and so much not like Vito. Very, very good points, pal. Really good stuff. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and also, I want to stay on Vito for a bit because there's a lot of great irony to the character it, throughout his story in this film. Because when he does eventually recover, and he he takes a step down as more an advers advising role to Michael as Michael is becoming the new dawn of the family, which eventually happens by the end of the film. But I think that, and I think Vito's death is such a, one of the most beautifully ironic things in cinema history to just die in such a trivial, simple way as playing with your grandson in the backyard. I thought it was a brilliant way because like, it's a gangster movie. You would expect like the, the boss to be assassinated 
and he, there's an assassination attempt on his life, but it's such beautiful irony that this moment where he's just trying to have fun with his God, with his grandfather, Anthony. Grandson. Grandson. <laughs> Did I say grandfather? <laughs> Benjamin grand Button. <laughs> <laughs> with his grandson, Anthony, just trying to get him to laugh and chase him around the yard, and then he has a heart attack and falls hard on the ground. Done. There's the end of his life. The greatest gangster alive in the world and he's done in the backyard garden i think that was such beautiful irony for the character yeah and true. unexpected and obviously we can assume that you know he had health complications from all he took five bullets into his body so but still you're right to die of a heart attack in the garden with his grandson in a completely innocent scene is very ironic for the character yeah i thought it was really beautiful now there's so many other great characters, but I kind of want to just set up the war for the film and what's going on. So we've, already, so we've already talked about how Barzini, we find out, is the secret person who's in the secret family that's backing Salazzo, and he's also backing the Tatalia family. So the Tatalia— He's trying to take the Corleones out. Yeah, he's yeah. trying to take them out, and the Tatalias are a pawn to him. Salazzo's a pawn to him, and Emilio Barzini is the head of the Barzini family and Corleone's rival, but was respected enough by Don Corleone to be invited to the wedding of his daughter, Connie. That's the guy. And if you don't remember in the in he the sits wedding, at the head of the table in the big meeting. But no, yeah. in the yeah. But at the wedding, he's the one who has the camera film taken out of the guys who takes a photo of him because he doesn't want a trace of him there. At I all. love that. I love that moment. And so Barzini, he does multiple things. He he uses the Tatalia family, like we said, as a as a pawn to approach Vito Corleone, introducing traffic kingpin drug lord Salazzo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, drug pin king lord Salazzo <laughs> to Bruno Tatalia. <laughs> Barzini also uses Carlo to get to assassinate Sonny. So he uses Carlo to make that farce with Connie. And he, he horribly beats her to have Connie call um, Sonny. Sonny, who he knew would hysterical. leave immediately yeah. hysterically to come after him. And, ha and they were waiting at the uh, the toll to take him out. And Carlo betrayed the Corleones because they wouldn't give him an actual job in the family. They gave him just like nothing, scraps. And so he wanted to have a bigger part to play in the family, but they wouldn't. Now, Barzini, they have two assassination attempts on the Don Vito. The first one was they thought was going to succeed when they shot him five times while he was picking fruit with his son, Fredo. And then the second assassination attempt, which they didn't get to get close to him, was when he's in the hospital by himself. And Michael comes back from New York to go see his father in the hospital. And no one's there. And Vito is able to work with Enzo, the baker who was also part of the one of the requests of a guest at the wedding to make sure he stays in Italy so that the baker's daughter could marry him. He's the son that that man's talking about. <laughs> He's He helps uh, Michael make it seem like they are armed men guarding the hospital so that the gangsters that Barzini sent couldn't assassinate Vito. So there are two assassination attempts by the Barzinis, the Tatalias, and Salazzo on the Don Vito, and they all fail. And then after this... The assassin, and then we don't see it, but Sonny, when he's acting Don while Vito is in the hospital and sick upstairs, Sonny takes out Bruno Tatalia, Tatalia's son, for revenge on the hit attempt. And then that's when Sonny gets taken out by the Tatalias and Barzini. And then it starts a war. But in order to try to stop the war momentarily, that's when the Don Vito, when he's healthy, calls the meeting of the five heads of houses of the families to offer peace with the Tatalias. But at this time, he's like, we don't know yet that Barzini's behind the entire thing. And Vito ensures the Tatalias and the rest of the families that he will not be the one to, to break the peace. However, he says that if anyone, if anything happens to Michael, if he be sh struck by a bolt of lightning, then he will get revenge. Because Michael's still a civilian at this point in the film. Exactly. No, yeah. No, not yeah, yet. This yeah, is when he's yeah, in, sorry. Yeah. This is, so this is when Michael's After, yeah, he's hiding in Italy. In Sicily. Because then we have the assassination by Michael on Salazzo and the captain. There's a really subtle hint in this scene that motivates Vito later on because Vito... Which scene? The, the heads of five houses? The heads of five families, yeah. Because Vito says... After that meeting, it's then he says, I didn't. I thought I was Tatalia, but it was Barzino all this time. Barzini, yeah. Barzini all this time. So what gave him that What gave him that information? Why would he decide? Why would he come up with that? And I think the, the hint in the meaning is Barzini is the one who's very upset about how Don Vito has all the politicians and all the judges in his pocket, and he won't share them with the other families. That, to Vito, 
was the biggest hint that Barzini is the one who was behind all of this to try and take him out to get his political contacts. That's very subtle, but that's clearly the main motivation Barzini had, and that's what Vito understands after the meeting. It's not like there was some secret thing said where, because um, why else would the, would Vito say it was Barzini all along? Mm -hmm. If that's the scene that we saw, what could give him that idea? It has to be Barzini outwardly saying in an aggressive tone, yeah, well, he has all the politicians in his hand and he won't give them out. That's what gave Vito the the made him realize it's Barzini all along because he's supposed to be acting as like a mediator between Corleone and Tatalia, but he's at, he's like he's the aggressor. He seems to be taking Tatalia's side on everything, and and he's just revealing what he's thinking inside. Yeah, and this is why when Michael takes over, it, he he does the most brilliant thing imaginable, and even the impossible. He takes them all out. Him and Vito conspire yeah. this. Yeah, at the same at the same time on the same day during the baptism. Obviously, it's the, one of the most famous editing sequences of all time, where Coppola cuts together the baptism with all the assassinations that Michael ordered. Do you renounce Satan? I do. And but this was the only this is the only play that the Corleones had in order to survive because they were going to keep coming after them time and time again until the Corleones were either dead or too weak to continue on. And so it was the best play Michael could have done by taking all of the families out. One of my favorite points of The Godfather and sequences in the film is after Michael goes to the hospital, saves Vito with Enzo, um, doesn't lose his cool at all. You can see a great character trait here where Enzo is shaking. He can't even light his own cigarette because I'm sure anyone would be after they almost get killed. Because he doesn't have a gun or anything, he's not. A, he's not a killer. He's not a mobster. Whereas Michael, because he's a former Marine, he's a hero. He's very controlled, reserved, and keeps his cool under pressure. Keeps calm. And then, immediately that night, Michael, we like Anthony's been saying, he's a great strate strategist, military strategist. He's a great wartime don, which we'll find out too. Where he gets the idea where he's going to be the one to take out McCluskey, the captain, the police captain who broke his jaw this night as well, and also take out Salazzo. Because Salazzo reached out to the Corleones and wanted to set up a meeting with Michael because they all know, like we said, that Michael's a civilian. He's not part of the family, so he's not ever to be assassinated. Even during the war, everyone knows not to kill Michael because that would be even a worse situation for the mob families in the, in, if, if they took out— Because he has no part in it. He has no part in it. So out of respect, no one's trying to take him out. So Salazzo wants to meet with Michael because he knows he's a civilian. But Michael's idea and plan, now that he's fully invested in the family, now he wants to be part of the family business after the assassination attempts on his father and watching him father, his father almost die in the hospital. He gets the brilliant idea to take out both Salazzo and McCluskey by himself at this meeting and this is a great sequence because we get them trying to use their informers to figure out where the meeting's going to be held uh it's at louis the italian restaurant in new york city in bronx in the bronx kid they hide the gun there it's really terrific but also this the plan seems outrageous at first um by tom and sonny but then michael using because he's so brilliant he's like don't we have newspaper people on our payroll we could spin stories in the press about this captain being a dirty cop involved with drugs and racketeering and involved heavily with the mafia as a way to spin it as a positive of him being killed. And that's what convinces Tom and Santino to agree to this in the first place. And also, uh, Michael shows great strategy in the hospital, you know, immediately, like, he takes command of the situation. Like the he calls the he calls his brother, tells the nurse he's like, stay there, stay right here with me. And then they move his the bed into a different area of the hospital, into like some back room. And then he immediately knows what to do with Enzo. So that's the first so scene to show his ability to strategize and take out enemies regardless of the situation, even if you aren't even armed, uh, to take out an enemy who has higher numbers and bigger fighting forces. Now, the meeting between Michael and Salazzo McCluskey is brilliant. I love how they're getting there and and, and Salazzo and his driver, they try to outsmart anyone if there's in case there's a tail, they they pull that U-turn while they're on their way to New Jersey because it's very stressful while they're eating Chinese food waiting for the call for the meeting after Sonny gets the informant to tell him that, you know, McCluskey has signed out at this restaurant at the precinct. So they hope that it's the right place. 
and they get the call last minute. And then when Michael's in the car and they're heading to New Jersey, the first time you're watching, you're like, oh, crap, they're not going to New York. The gun's not going to be there. What's going to happen now? They bang the UE, they go back to New York, and they pull out in front of Louis, which is great. to find. And Michael, you can see the relief on him. Very nuanced performance here inside the car with his, a lot of eye performing here by, by Al Pacino, just doing so many emotions, just emotion emoting through his eyes and subtle facial expressions. And the scene's great, and I love this scene because it's in Italian – between Salazzo and Michael, but Coppola decides not to translate what Michael and Salazzo are saying to non-Italian speakers. You know, why did he do this? And I'm sure it drove the studio absolutely berserk to not do this. Because there are captions everywhere else. Yeah. The reason why, I think, is because you don't need it. You don't. You know what this conversation's about, even if you don't speak Italian, without subtitles. You know Salazzo's motivations. You know his goals. You know Michael's motivations. You know his goals. And I think the scene's a lot more powerful if you don't show the actual dialogue, because if you're not an Italian speaker, it forces you to ignore Salazzo and everything he's saying, and you're just watching Michael. You're watching Michael's performance by, by Al Pacino. You're watching Michael's facial expressions, his body language. You're focusing on these nuanced, comp nuanced complex feelings he's having. You know, he's about to kill these two men. He's also unsure if the gun's planted in the back. He's also unsure of what's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 minutes, what's going to happen after he kills these two men. You see his body language. You see his anxiety. You see his anger, his rage as the conversation is going forward. And But like, it just, but again, the, the words are irrelevant. But if you want to know what he said, basically, Salazzo is apologizing for Michael. You can tell that he's, he says, like, I respect your father yeah. very much. So basically, yeah. but what he's saying is Salazzo apologizes for Michael's broken jaw, tells him everything was just business, nothing personal. He respects his father very much very much the assassination attempt it was just business your father's thinking is outdated he salato wants peace he doesn't want violence your father's in bad shape yada 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 bull to the back bull to the face after going to the, get, get the gun basically it's a great moment and i love the i love when when michael's in the bathroom and after he gets the gun because at first it takes him a minute to find it and you're like oh my god you better find that thing <laughs> and then he does find it but then he stops outside the stall and he just like he holds his head and he's just like, he's just doing this thing with his hands against his hair, just like I'm about to murder two people. It's a great little moment in the train. And I love how just the train gets louder and louder and louder until Michael eventually stands up with a pistol and just. But the thing with Michael is, even Sonny jokes them, he's like, Oh, you're gonna be a killer now. I'm like, it's not like in the war where you're a hundred feet away. You actually get up, have to get up close and go bang right in their faces. So, you we can assume Michael's killed before being a war hero and everything and being a Marine in World War II. But like Sonny says, it's completely different when you're looking them in the eye up close with a revolver right to the head. It also shows that Sonny's clearly killed people. Yeah, like they all have. Blank. They're all either murderers or accessories yeah, to murder. They've all done it in some capacity at some at some moment in time. Now, Tom, Sonny, and, and Michael, before this happens, they're they're, they're predicting what's going to happen. You know, they know there's going to be crackdowns. You kill a cop, there's going to be consequences. You kill a cop, you're going downtown. Is that from Goodwill Hunting? <laughs> you hit a cop. You hit a cop, <laughs> you're going downtown. So this starts the war, all-out war, between the Tatalias and the Corleones. And so this happens after the murder of, of Salazzo McCluskey. And now there's not only just the war, but the crackdown on organized crime that's going to leave every family desperate. They're going to all lose money. They're all going to bleed. This, there's massive raids all over the city because of the organized crime. They're, they're hitting everybody. And this is where the phrase of going to the mattresses happens, where they're the sequences of the mobsters living in that apartment for months with just with the mattresses. You know, that's why they're the Paul. I mean, um. Uh, Clemenza brings it up earlier before he takes out uh, Paulie. He's like, make sure you get like 16 mattresses. We need the mattresses and put them up in that apartment because they know this is going to happen. And this sequence was actually um, created and edited by George Lucas. Was it really? All the newspaper articles, all those old photographs montaged together. He did it as a favor to Coppola for f helping fund THX 1138. And so uh, he actually used real crime scene photos and real newspaper articles um, illustrating like real deaths within the mafia across New York City. And so all those photos are real. And he cut it all together using like he's a special effects and visual effects whiz, made it really interesting. And so you can thank George Lucas for that awesome montage. And then Michael goes to Sicily to hide out for at least a year. And this this sequence is incredible, you know, to actually 
be in Sicily. You know, Paramount wanted him to like, can't you shoot it somewhere else that looks like Sicily? Can't He's you like, show it in Kansas City? No, we got to go to Sicily. And I love when Michael's there. You know, he meets and marries Apollonia. Um, but unfortunately for Michael, while he's there, Barzini got word that he was hiding in his father's hometown of Corleone, Sicily. He bought off one of Michael's bodyguards there, Fabrizio, who planted the bomb in Michael's car. Instead, the bomb killed Michael's wife, Apollonia. I love this sequence because Michael's story has three chapters. He has the chapter of him reluctantly, of him avoiding his family business and then entering the family business and then him hiding in Sicily and starting a new life. And then him um, back in New York, um, slowly becoming the new Don. So it's three great chapters for the character. But this chapter is very important because, you know, he falls in love in this in this chapter. He he gets married. And I think that his feelings towards Apollonia are far greater than his feelings towards Kay. I think that if he was if he if Apollonia came to New York with him, he would have treated her a lot better than he treated Kay. Um, I think that. His de I think the death of Apollonia uh, informs his, you know, bitterness and resentment he ends up having for his wife. Um, because I would argue that Michael never loved Kay. Um, I don't think he ever did. I think he tried to. I think that he, when he was trying to be someone else, trying not to be a Corleone, I think that he was like, I want to be a boyfriend. I want to be, I want to be a husband to this woman. I don't think he truly loved Kay. And I think an indicator of this is that phone call that he gets where Clemenza makes fun of him, like, why didn't you say you love that girl? And I know he, it's, he's, on the surface, he's trying to save himself embarrassment from the guys in the room of saying I love you to your sweetheart. But I think it's an indicator of him not truly loving Kay. I think if, you know, if Apollonia was on the phone, he would say, he, he would say I love you to her. And then also, um, he abandons Kay, um, uh, Without any sign of when he'll come back to see her, he doesn't give any, any indication of how long he'll be gone, but he basically abandons her to go to his family. This is when he goes to the hospital in New York to visit his father and then saves him. And then also when he does return from Sicily, he's back for over a year in New York before, before he finally goes to find Kay. And when he does go to Kay, it seems as though it's pretty clear that his intention with Kay is just a, a mother to father children for him so that he can carry on the Corleone name, carry on the, the, the family, because Sonny's gone. Uh, Fredo, he's not going to have any kids, and he's not really part of the family, truly. And so I think that Michael is using Kay as a means for creating a family, because he says that to her like pretty quickly. He's like, he doesn't say just, he doesn't just say it's because I love you, it's because he brings up children immediately, in that conversation, in like that pitch to her. He's like pitching her, uh, marry me so we can have children. I think his main intention with Kay, after losing Apollonia, Apollonia, I don't think he could ever love again. And so Kay becomes a mother only to him. Yeah, I think he goes to Kay for selfish reasons as well. I think he, he can control Kay. And like yeah. you said, he just wants to use her for children. Um, I think he he probably still loves her, maybe. I'm not, it's, it's hard to tell because I don't, I really seem don't like think they're in does. love in the beginning. But again, he's trying to be something he's not. Exactly. But what you can say is he does trust her, I'm sure. He trusts her with being part of the family and everything like that. Um, but yeah, it's it's unfortunate to, to use her like that, just to, to be someone to make children with him to carry on his name. Because he's never going to open up with her because he, he refuses to ever tell her about her family business. I would say Vito was probably more open with his wife. It's not, I mean, we don't know that for sure, but I, I would say so. It's possible. Now, while um, Michael's in Italy, we get word of right before the assassination and killing, accidental killing of Apollonia, which was intended for Michael, he gets word from New York bad news that Sonny was assassinated. And so now, now after the assassination of Sonny and the killing of Apollonia, Michael comes back to, to America, comes back to New York. This is where the heads of the five families meet, which we've already talked about. And then My Michael and Vito start to plan the future of the house. And so now Michael is acting head the family. of the, um, the family. <laughs> you keep saying like Game of Thrones, like the house of houses, like Game of like <laughs> House <Harry> Corleone. <laughs> <laughs> Michael is now head of the family of the Corleone crime syndicate. And Vito is more of a consigliere in a lot of ways or just an advisor, like he says. But it's really interesting because loyalties are starting to shift where 
Testio and Clemenza, they may not have full loyalties towards Michael yet because, you know, he's not proven himself. But also Michael and Vito seem to have a secret plan that they won't even share with Tom Hagen. And that plan is really genius because Vito knows that as soon as Vito dies, which he I'm sure he knows is going to be soon, Barzini is going to make a move against Michael and against the Corleones. And he knows that whoever comes to Michael with a meeting from Barzini will be the person who's betraying and is the traitor and ends up being Tessio, even though it's great how Coppola and um, Puzzo kind of make it a, make the assumption or make it seem like Clemenza is going to be the one because Tessio stays and shakes Michael's hand in the office when Clemenza doesn't. And Tessio is the one who gets them to plant the gun. He's like, I know Luigi's. It has that, Lu- yeah, that Louis, toilet. The old-fashioned toilet. So he helps aid them in killing um, the other two. But then Michael's like, it's it's... Obviously, well, Tessio's always been smarter than Clemenza. It's the smart move. It's just business, you know, a common phrase in this film. But, you know, Vito predicted all this. He knew all this was going to happen. And then after Vito dies, before they can all make a move against Michael, I'm sure he worked with Vito on this plan as well, where they, he decides to take out all of the other heads of house, heads of families. He, he does the, the <laughs> baptism sequence where <laughs> after Vito's death, before Barzini moves on him, they, Michael takes out the heads of the other families before they can hit him. So Michael, during the sequence, it's brilliant, is literally becoming godfather to Connie and Carlo's child while also becoming the godfather to the Corleone family, sealing his position with blood and death. So, Mike, so metaphorical. And Michael has an alibi during this whole thing as he stands godfather to Michael Francis Rizzi. And during the sequence, Michael and Michael's men take out Emilio Barzini, Mo Green, Victor Siracci, Philip Tatalia and Carmine Carmine Cuneo. And it's great Coppola saved all of this bloodshed for basically the end of the film. Uh, you know, we said gangster films, they were littered with violence. It's something that always was expected. Other than the Sony the Sunny attack, uh, you didn't really see that much. And that Sunny attack is a, is a great death scene, one of the best ever. But this is truly just like incredible writing. Uh, incredible directing and editing just in one of the best edited sequence and just the irony of someone renouncing Satan while he's ordering the deaths of many people at the same time it's just so genius such one it's this movie has like three main acts and it's like this third act once it, it gets going you're like how is this movie still so good it's it's unbelievable and then we get the complete transformation of Michael Corleone into Don Corleone. Now you could say Michael is just pure evil. He's a murderer. He then, after the sequence, has his brother-in-law murdered, Carlo, after making him confess to working with Barzini to plan the assassinate the assassination of his brother Sonny on the freeway, makes his sister a widow. He's just done terrible, terrible things now. And the final sequence of, as Kay, like Eddie said, outside the door, and he's being basically turned into the dawn. Everyone's showing their respect by kissing his hand. We see Clemenza there. We see other uh, other members and lieutenants of him kissing his hand. And now he has become the dawn of the Corleone family. And now the Corleones are the most powerful family in the United States. And what's interesting about Michael is he seems to be enjoying it. I think that's that scene with Carlo, it's, it's very indicative of Michael seems to, he seems to be relishing in his new power. He seems to be relishing the control he has over other people and the respect that he's earned. Um, and also, the way he sp- speaks to Carlo, he's like, don't tell me I'm wrong because it insults my intelligence. You know, he's he's so, like, peak-level anti-hero villain at this point. I think it's a terrific scene. And it shows... I think that really shows his dark nature, that sequence, that scene where... And also his his ability to just lie to someone's face, like I'm not gonna make my sister a widow, right after that I I'm I'm gonna watch you die by my man's hand, like right outside. Because him, which he learned this from Vito, he knows how to make his enemies comfortable, relaxed, and drop their guard. Vito and Michael do this when Michael comes back from Italy. He's now head of the family. And in order to lull Barzini into sort of like this false sense of security and confidence, they let Barzini start to muscle them out of different areas of their crime syndicate, of their their resources, you could say. This makes Barzini feel very confident, drops his 
It makes him more vulnerable, and this allows them to get to Barzini really easily when he just has one other guy with him at the time of his assassination. So the same thing he does with Carlo. He's like you say, he's like, I'm not going to make my sister a widow. I'm not going to kill my my godfather's father. Like, well, I'm not going to do something like that. Here's a ticket. You're going to get on a plane. Just never come back. I never want to see you again. Uh, just confess to me that you did it, and let me know who you worked with. Okay, it's Barzini. Get in the car and go to, go fly away. And th these are things that Sonny would have never been able to do. He would have never been able to hold his temper. He would have gone after everyone with guns blazing. And he would have... I think that Sonny Santino, if he had remained Don, he would have destroyed the Corleone family. And it's because of his just natural temper and fury that he has. He's un his inability to think he, he feeds off his emotions. He's a very emotional person. Whereas Michael seems to be cut off and very closed off and very unemotional. Um, the only emotional moments he has are when he yells at Kay at the end and also when he um, when he saves his father's life. You can you can say those are the most emotional moments for Michael and when uh, Apollonio, Apollonia dies. Um, but other than that, he he's able to really master himself and his emotions, which makes him uh, a master dawn during wartime. Another great example is cutting Tom Hagen out of what's going on behind the closed doors there. He cuts him as consigliari. He just becomes a lawyer for the family at the end of the film, basically. And he outs him. And, you know, it's a curious decision. Tom doesn't understand why. But Vito just reassures him that it's the best thing to do. You know, he's, you're not a wartime consigliari. Even Sonny says that to him. If I had a wartime consigliari, I wouldn't have to deal with this stuff. So Michael understands that what he has to do is just... To, Tom would have never approved. Yeah, probably something like that. Yeah, that's why they took him out. Mm -hmm. I mean, not took him out, but that's why he was out. So he doesn't completely let emotion determine his decisions. Yeah, I mean, because Tom also thinks about, you know, repercussions and, you know, the effects that actions have, whereas Michael, and I'm sure Vito understood that if they didn't do this, there was no way they would have survived the long run. And one of the most important elements of the baptism sequence and the assassinations is killing Mo Green because even though, you know, what Michael did to Mo Green is exactly, you could say, what Vito did when he was helping Johnny Fontaine get his career. He's like, makes them an offer, $10,000 for Johnny Fontaine's contract. And he asked Mo Green, what, what, what's a price to buy your casino? And after the refusal... Uh, with Vito, he used Luca Brasi to hold the gun to the guy's head to sign a contract for $1,000 to let go of Johnny Fontaine. And here, Michael just assassinates Mo Green and takes control of his casinos in Las Vegas. Yeah, it's it, it's just a brilliant play by him. And also, I, I never really see this talked about this, but this movie has a great bookend. Um, it has bookend moments of loyalty. So the the movie both starts and ends with um, someone kissing the hand of the Godfather. And so obviously in the opening scene with Bonacera, um, when he shows fealty and loyalty and kisses Don Vito's hand in loyalty and thanks for um, honoring his request, you know, it's, it's a traditional thing that Don Vito has dealt with. It's happened to him many times. And then the end of the film, Michael his final transformation into the Godfather is his lieutenants kissing his hands in fealty and loyalty. And it's this really terrific bookend of the trans transfer of power from Godfather to Godfather. And it's in that moment that Michael becomes the Godfather, I think. Um, and it's a really brilliant bookend to this film. Um, I don't think it's really talked about too much, but I've always seen that as like such a great way to parallel Vito and Michael. Oh, absolutely agree. 100% kid. 100%. 100. And that's when he's even called Godfather for the first time. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. It is the first time. I got a ton of fun facts we can do. All right. that That's pretty good analysis of the Godfather, I think. How about we great. just do some trivia and fun facts and wrap it up? I would love to. All right. What you got? Okay. Un momento. Okay. <clears throat> During an early shot of the scene where Vito Corleone returns home and his people carry him up the stairs... Marlon Brando secretly put weights under his body on the bed as a prank to his co-stars to make it harder for them to lift him up the steps. 
Lenny Montana, who plays Luca Brasi, was so nervous about working with Marlon Brando that in the first take of their scene together, he flubbed some lines. Director Francis Ford Coppola liked the genuine nervousness and used it in the final cut. The scenes of Luca, Luca practicing his speech were added later. Cinematographer Gordon Willis earned himself the nickname the Prince of Darkness since his sets were so underlit. Paramount Pictures executives initially thought that the footage was way too dark until they were persuaded otherwise by both Willis and Coppola that it was to emphasize the shadiness of the Corleone family's dealings. In The Godfather, the cat held by Marlon Brando in the opening scene was a stray cat that Coppola found while on the lot at Paramount Pictures. It was not originally called for in the script. So he ended up putting the, the cat in Marlon Brando's lap and the cat's purring was so loud that it muffled some of Marlon Brando's dialogue. As a result, most of his lines had to be looped. That cat loved Brando. <laughs> his purring so loud. <laughs> James Cann improvised the part where he throws the FBI photographer's camera onto the ground and breaks it. The other actor's frightened reaction is actually genuine because they weren't expecting it. Cann also improvised the idea of throwing money at the man to make up for breaking his camera. As James Cann put it in an interview, where I come from, if you break something, you replace it or you repay the owner. Marlon Brando, like I said earlier, did not memorize most of his lines and read from cue cards during most of the film. As a matter of fact, Marlon, who was the father of method acting, was famous for this. He felt that doing a cold open type of reading for the camera and then using that very first unpracticed take was the best way to get an authentic performance. He did the exact same thing for Superman during the set for Krypton, which was filmed with cards pasted hair in there on the walls for Marlon Brando to read his lines for the first time in each scene. Despite winning the Oscar for Best Actor in a Leading Role by Marlon Brando in The Godfather, Brando famously rejected his Oscar to shed light on the indigenous people of America and give them a voice on the world's largest stage. Sachin Littlefeather stunned Hollywood when she was sent on behalf of Marlon Brando to reject his 1973 Oscar for Best Actor. She promised Marlon she wouldn't touch the Oscar at all. All right, that wraps our episode on The Godfather. I'm sure you can probably guess what the next episode is going to be after this one. <laughs> uh, we love talking about this movie. This is both one of our top 10 greatest films of all time, top five for sure. Uh, one of our favorite movies. It was so fun to finally talk about it. We hope you really enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed talking about it. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to subscribe if you're new. Hit the like button. Leave a comment. Find us on all audio streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us. Find us on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to check out one of these other videos right here for more content on our favorite films and breaking down all kinds of movie content. Thanks so much.